Hello, coming to you from St. Martin de Porres. Today is the Feast of St. Jerome, and so I figured let's meditate on the life of St. Jerome this day. And I think it's important to note first and foremost that Jerome is not his original name. His original name is Eusebius Sophronius Hieronymus. It's a mouthful. But um, he is known to us as Jerome. Now, Jerome was born in 347 AD. This is after the Edict of Toleration that Saint, um, rather Emperor Constantine had issued in 315 AD. So Jerome is born during a time of relative stability and prosperity for the church. The church is allowed to practice in the open now free of persecution. So he's born 347 AD to a rich uh, Christian family. Jerome's family sends him off for a very robust liberal arts education at a young age, and he studies grammar and rhetoric in Rome. He also becomes a master of Latin. In some sense, this early portion of his life is similar to Gregory the Great. You might remember I gave Gregory's biography a while back. And um, like Gregory, Jerome had uh, a second to none liberal arts education and he mastered the Latin language. But there's something unique about Jerome. He was obsessed with classical Roman literature. Anything from the ancient Romans from the time of the ancient Republic, for instance, if he could get his hands on it, he would study it, whether it be the great, um, the great writers like Cicero, for instance. Um, he would just absorb these and uh, devour them, for lack of a better term. And it's during this time that as he's mastering the Latin language and absorbing himself in classical Roman literature, he, um, he begins acquiring Latin manuscripts. It's the beginning of Jerome's library. He was known for having an extensive library. So he begins forming this library from a young age. Now, he, um, he was a rambunctious youth, for lack of a better term, and um, he would later have... Um, he would have bouts of guilt for uh, various events during his youth. Uh, but he would calm his conscience in some sense of the term during his teenage years by visiting the tombs of the apostles and the martyrs on Sundays. Now, mind you, it's important to note that during this time of his, uh, during this time of youthful indulgence, Jerome... Um, Jerome is not yet a Christian. See, it's important to note this because during this time, it was commonplace for parents to allow their children to decide when to be baptized. The church has always allowed for infant baptism, but the widespread encouragement that an infant be baptized, lest it um, not be clean of original sin, if it were to die unexpectedly, that emphasis was not placed upon the consciences of Christian parents until the time of Augustine. It was from the teaching of Augustine onward that parents began to be encouraged for the sake of the child's salvation that it be baptized as soon as possible. But that's from the 5th century onwards. Jerome lived during a time when that emphasis was not placed because there was that hope prior to Augustine. There was that hope that if a child were to die before baptism, we commend them to the mercy of God. That is the same position of the church today. But from Augustine up until the Second Vatican Council, there was this excessive fear that if we don't baptize the child, the child will end up in hell. But like I said, if the child is not baptized, the understanding before Augustine's time, so this was during the time of Jerome, and of our time since the Vatican, Second Vatican Council, is that 
A child that dies before baptism is simply commended into the arms of the merciful Father who knows how to judge rightly. And so Jerome was not baptized by his parents, although that was an option. He was not baptized. Um, he was not baptized by his parents' wishes as a young child. He was baptized at the age of 18. He came to his own conversion. And so, like I said, August, um, sorry, Jerome, during this time of youthful indulgence, he, um, he is not a Christian at the time, but yet he is familiar with Christianity. He's living in a Christian culture. He's sprung from a Christian family. And so there's an impulse in him to visit the tombs of the apostles and the martyrs on Sundays. And you can see this is the seeds of his conversion. And he does this to calm his conscience, to have uh, some form of peace in the midst of everything that is going on in this life. But like I said, later on, he would have bouts of guilt for what, whatever happened in his youth. And his later coming to monastic life is meant to be the counterbalance of what happens during that time period. Um, so he was baptized in 365 AD, so that's when he's 18. And he initially attempts to enter civil service. But... After a few years of that, he comes to this awareness that monastic life, ascetical life, is really meant for him. And so he abandons his civic career and he enters monastic life at around 370 AD. So about five years after his baptism. Now, there is a, uh, a story which he records that um, we don't know exactly when it happens, but um, Jerome had had a dream. Might have been around 373, 374, but once again, we don't know exactly when. But it was shortly after he entered monastic life, they had this dream of the Lord speaking to him, saying that you are a Ciceronian, not a Christian. And... What Jerome took from that is that God was saying to him that you are so obsessed, even now after your conversion, you are so obsessed with the works of classical Roman literature, like the works of Cicero, that you're not in your heart of hearts a follower of Christ. If you wish to be a follower of Christ, meditate on the works of Christ, particularly the scriptures. So if you will, Jerome eventually comes to believe in the Christian faith. And then several years after that, he um, becomes a monk. But it's only a few years after he becomes a monk that he has an even more dramatic conversion where he realizes that he has placed too much emphasis in his life on classical Roman literature. He needs to start immersing himself in the scriptures. And it's from this point on that Jerome as a monk who is now on fire with, um, with love of scripture, that we begin to see the Jerome that we know of take shape. So if he's baptized at the age of 18, right? In 365, and then in 370, he becomes a monk. So that's around the age of 23. It's then, if this vision allegedly happened around 373, 374, that means that he was in his late 20s when he really had this fiery impulse for scripture, this turning about in his life. Okay. So, at around um, 380... He begins to um, learn Greek and Hebrew. But let me back up for a quick second. So I said that he had this conversion moments on top of his 
already Christian conversion, right? He had this conversion moment of a love for scripture around 373, so in the late 20s. Well, at the end of that decade, 379, so he's in his early 30s now, he's ordained a presbyter. And he's ordained a presbyter by Paulinus, the then bishop of Antioch. So Jerome, during this time period, he moves from Rome to the east. He moves from Rome to the east. He settles down in Antioch. He joins a monastic community in Antioch. He begins to learn Greek and Hebrew there. And it's during this time that the bishop of Antioch, Paulinus, ordains Jerome a presbyter around 379. So that's his early 30s. Now, it's important to note here that Paulinus was one of two contenders for the bishopric of Antioch. It was between Paulinus and Miletus. Now, there were some regional synods of bishops that said that Miletus was the actual bishop of Antioch. But Paulinus claimed that he was the real bishop of Antioch. We have to remember that there were moments in church history where elections of bishops were disputed. And so there was a dispute here in the church of Antioch. And Paulinus was the claimant, was one of the two claimants. And even though regional synods didn't uh, side with him, the Church of Rome did. So Paulinus and his young presbyter Jerome visited Rome. And there was a synod in Rome. And let me find out what year that synod was. That synod was in 382. So Jerome is ordained 379. Paulinus, Paulinus's ordination as a bishop is vindicated in 382, so several years after Jerome is ordained a presbyter. But nobody in the East accepts this decision. So Paulinus doesn't have a church to go back to. Um, once again, this is how tense these disputes were over the elections of bishops. So Jerome, having been ordained by a bishop whose election wasn't accepted in the East, but it was in Rome in 382, Jerome and his bishop Paulinus are stuck in limbo. What do we do? Well, Jerome decides to uh, busy himself. And so having learned Greek and Hebrew and being a master in Latin, he dedicates himself during his stay in Rome to translation work. And as he does so, um, his bishop Paulinus at some point decides to go back to Antioch, but in a foolhardy way because nobody's going to accept him. Jerome realizes that and he says, well, you know what? I'm already back in Rome. Let me stay put. And he becomes the secretary of Pope Damascus I in 383. And he's only his secretary for a little more than a year because Pope Damascus dies in 384. Now, Jerome, being uh, very uh, zealous for certain things, he actually wished, he notes this in one of his letters, he wished that he was elected Bishop of Rome to succeed Pope Damascus. But, uh, but save it to say that Jerome obviously did not succeed him. But... Uh, while he was secretary Pope Damascus I, uh, he helped establish the, the beginnings of the papal library. And um, he, um, he, gathered, um, he gathered the anger of many people in Rome because as the secretary, the Pope, as the collector of all these sacred manuscripts, he began to call out people uh, in the city of Rome for, uh, for certain lifestyles, if you will. He was one who would beat people over their heads for their, uh, for their moral living, and uh, he gathered uh, a lot of anger for that. So when Pope Damascus I died, Jerome didn't have his benefactor and protector anymore. Pope Damascus' successor didn't think too highly of Jerome. And like I said, Jerome had already angered 
a lot of people in Rome at the time. And uh, it didn't even help that he got into disputes with uh, famous theologians of his day, one of whom was Augustine himself, and even Ambrose of Milan. So you have two great saints of the Western Church, Ambrose and Augustine, two phenomenal theologians who later on would be doctors of the church like Jerome, but yet Jerome is in constant tension with them. So Jerome angers the people of Rome. He angers the great theologians of his day, which we even venerate as doctors of the church. And because he's attempting to live a monastic life at the time, but in the city of Rome, he's seeking hospitality uh, from widows and people begin to churn out rumors, um, false rumors, but rumors nonetheless of uh, his relationship with these widows. And so Jerome is effectively driven out of the city of Rome by 385. So he's only in Rome for a few years. And like I said, by 385, he's out of the city of Rome. He's been driven out. And he settles in Bethlehem. So notice... Jerome begins in Rome, then he goes to the east to Antioch where he's ordained a presbyter, and then over disputes over his bishop's ordination, he returns back to Rome for a synod, and he settles down there, but now he's driven out of Rome and now he's back in the east. It's a constant back and forth of Jerome's life. He's a world traveler, I guess, but it's because of unfortunate events in his life. Uh, but anyways, he settles in Bethlehem. In 386, and during his stay in Bethlehem, he founds a monastery and three convents. So his zeal for monastic life is still very prevalent. But it's during his stay in Bethlehem that he translates most of the Bible. So Jerome's uh, Opus Magnus, his greatest work, was his translation of the Hebrew Old Testament and Greek New Testament into Latin, into the vernacular of the average Roman person. And Jerome does this over a 20-year period. This is a massive undertaking. Remember, this is before you have, before you could access dictionaries online and everything. So Jerome is basing many of these things off of his memory and manuscripts in front of him. So it's good that he has this great library on hand, right? But he begins this work in 384. So before he's driven out of Rome, he begins his process of translation. And then he completes it in 404. So it's he does most of it while he's in Bethlehem. And I guess you could say it's fitting that he's translating the Hebrew scriptures and the Greek scriptures in the very land in which they were written. There's something fitting about it. And it's also fitting that he's doing it in Bethlehem of all places. It's the place where, although the word became flesh in Nazareth when Mary conceived the word, um, the word was born in Bethlehem. So it's fitting that the written word of the eternal word is being translated by Jerome in the city in which the word of God was born. But anyways, he does his greatest work during that 20-year period and like I said, part of the problem is that, um, you know, he has, he's translating 72 books of scripture. So that's one time issue, right? The other issue is he doesn't have the advantage of modern technology, so he can't access um, dictionaries and manuscripts at the same speed at which we can, right? But the other issue is that, He's constantly embroiled in controversy, theological controversy. He's constantly debating with people over how to properly interpret the works of the great scripture scholar Origen from the 200s. Um, and he, like I have already alluded to, and this began when he was in the city of Rome, he's embroiled in theological battles with the great theologians of his day. So he's constantly writing back and forth. So in the process of translating the entirety of the Bible, he's um, he's writing these great these other great theological manuscripts 
to uh, to the what would become the doctors of the church. So Jerome has a lot on his plate. And save it to say, after 20 grueling years, he finally completes the Latin translation of scripture known as the Vulgate. Now, I have to note that Jerome does something during this time that will lay the seeds for the Protestant Reformation. What do I mean? Jerome and his interpretation of scripture placed a higher value on the original Hebrew books of the Old Testament. Now you might remember me mentioning this in other podcasts that the Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church, have more books in their Old Testament than the Protestant uh, churches. Now, the Catholic number is 46 books. The Protestant number is 39, so that's a seven-book discrepancy. Now, these other books, um, these seven books, were later than the 39 books. That's an acknowledged, right? So, you have 46 books in the Catholic Old Testament, and it's acknowledged that the 39 books that we hold in common with the Protestants were written in Hebrew originally. And then the last seven books were written by Greek-speaking Jews in Alexandria as the world was being Hellenized after the conquest of Alexander the Great. But nevertheless, they were inspired by God. And the early church... Pope Damascus, the first of all people, who Jerome was the secretary of, issued solemnly that the canon of Scripture has 46 books in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament. And he included these seven, these seven books that were originally written in Greek and later on than the Hebrew Old Testament books. He included those as inspired in that canon. And many of the church fathers do so. Well, what of Jerome? Jerome, because of his appreciation of the Hebrew Old Testament, and because he learned Hebrew from rabbis while studying in the Holy Land, Jerome placed a higher value on the Hebrew books of the Old Testament than the Greek books. So Jerome does a very important move that will lay the seeds of the Reformation. Jerome says that the 39 Hebrew books of the Old Testament are the Old Testament proper. The seven other books that are of Greek origin are not on the same level of inspiration as the Hebrew books, but they are fitting for education. For um, There's no heresy in them. They're fitting for maturation in the Christian faith. You will not find any error in them, but he didn't place them on the same level of inspiration as the Hebrew books. So he put these at the appendix of the Bible. And that's why the Protestants during the Reformation would refer to these books as the Apocrypha. They placed, they took Jerome's precedent and the precedent of the rabbis and said we're going to prioritize the 39 books of the Old Testament written in Hebrew, and we will content ourselves with looking at these other seven books written in Greek originally as being material in an appendix. Useful for Christian education, but not on the same level of inspiration. So in this respect, the dispute between us and the Protestants goes back to Jerome. And the Protestants can say, we have a precedent in Jerome. Now, the uh, like I said, the irony of ironies here is that, the, that Pope Damascus I, of whom Jerome was a secretary of, uh, presided over a synod in Rome, that declared that the canon of Scripture 
had 72 books, 46 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. So the Pope at the time that Jerome was so acquainted with, so affectionate towards, had a completely different position than Jerome. And he uh, didn't even put this forth as a private position. Pope, Pope Damascus had it sanctioned by a synod in Rome and all other church fathers did. So Jerome is an anomaly amongst his peers. And so likewise, when, the Protest when our Protestant brothers and sisters will look to Jerome as a precedent, they're looking to an anomaly in reality, a voice in the tradition that is not um, in continuity, excuse me, not in continuity with the rest of the tradition around him. Another important detail, as we're coming to the close of this podcast, another important detail is that Jerome sometimes is at the wrong place at the wrong time, as we can see, based upon what I've described so far, when Pope Damascus I died, leaving Jerome with no protection in Rome. Well, Jerome, when he was in Bethlehem, his monastery was under the jurisdiction of the Bishop of Jerusalem, whose name was John at the time. And John of Jerusalem got into a dispute with a bishop by the name of Epiphanius. And Epiphanius was acquainted with Jerome's monastic community. And he had a high opinion of Jerome's brother. So Epiphanius came to Jerome's monastery and because of his high opinion of Jerome's brother, he ordained Jerome's brother to the diaconate. But this is an ecclesiological problem because Jerome's monastery was not under Epiphanius' jurisdiction. It was under the jurisdiction of John of Jerusalem, the Bishop of Jerusalem. And so for that reason, John of Jerusalem excommunicated the whole monastery. Which means that Jerome was excommunicated. And Jerome was excommunicated for, a series, uh, for several years and it was only through the intervention of other uh, other bishops in the area that Jerome was able to be reconciled to his own bishop, to John of Jerusalem, and be readmitted to communion. So Jerome wasn't, so to say, in the wrong, but it was more of that he was at the wrong place at the wrong time, guilt by association, by being a part of a monastic community and communicating with his brother. Daily partaking of the Eucharist with his brother, who was illegitimately ordained a deacon. Uh, Jerome was guilty by association, guilty by communicating in the sacred mysteries with someone that was not lawfully ordained. So this raises an ecclesiological issue that we're not very conscious of today. But in the ancient church, they were very conscious of how if you communicated, if you shared in the sacred mysteries and the sacraments, with someone who had um, grievously wounded the unity of the church, then you were excommunicated by association with them. And that's a legitimate discipline. And so, like I said, Jerome is at the wrong place at the wrong time. And so by being of this monastic community, that his, that his brother is also a part of, and by regularly, by regularly sharing in the Eucharist with his brother, who had been uh, illegitimately ordained a deacon, Jerome is excommunicated by association. But like I said, Jerome is, event is eventually reconciled with his bishop, John of Jerusalem. And so he dies in the peace and communion of the church. Now, Jerome dies on September 30th, 420 AD. So that's why we have his feast day on September 30th. It's the day on which he died. But um, very unfortunately, four years before his death, Bethlehem was ransacked and uh, by a group of bandits and marauders. And unfortunately, 
the bandits and marauders destroy Jerome's library. So Jerome's library is lost to us, and I can't even imagine the kind of devastation he would have had over how, you know, his newfound love was for scripture, and he just immersed his whole life in it now. And all that was destroyed. Thank God his translation of the, of the Old and New Testament was not destroyed. We had the Vulgate. But unfortunately, his library was destroyed. So Jerome had a lot of hardships, for lack of a better term. Now, the last thing I want to know is that um, Jerome, if you look at sacred art, Jerome will often be depicted as having a lion at his feet. And according to legend, um, there was a lion, maybe it was a young cub at the time, but according to legend, there is a lion that approached Jerome with a thorn in his paw and Jerome removed it. And out of gratitude, the, the lion was always uh, faithful to Jerome and always at his side. So that's why in sacred art, Jerome is always depicted as having a lion at his feet. But I think uh, this has been a very, uh, very exciting exposition on his life because there's so many details that show that Jerome was quite a character. The last detail I do want to note is that you notice, as I've said, that he got into so many disputes with his contemporaries that you can see in his writings uh, a glimpse of his character. That is to say that Jerome had a short fuse. Jerome uh, was known for going on tirades and rants against people and in a very angry way. You can just, can you can sense the body language just by reading his writings against people. So Jerome was a very passionate man Passionate in his love for scripture. Also passionate with his short fuse and getting embroiled in all these controversies and so on. So Jerome is a reminder to us that the communion of saints is a uh, communion of fallen people that have been raised, that have been justified by God in Christ. It is a communion of people who know that they are journeying along the way and that they are not perfect, but they one day will be in Christ. Christ is our perfection, our peace, and our justification. So although Jerome was a great character in his day, uh, for, for good or for bad, um, Jerome is a reminder to us that any one of us can be saints and that even in spite of our own shortcomings, that we can reach the heights of holiness. So I hope this has been a good meditation on his life. I hope it's been exciting. And I hope that, um, that we garner some important things, some important truths. Above all, a love for sacred scripture. As St. Jerome famously said, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. So may we meditate on scripture with burning love, just like Jerome. And may we have confidence that whenever we read sacred scripture or even read the lives and writings of the saints, we are encountering the God who made heaven and earth. So have a peaceful day and many blessings. Peace.